Stories are powerful. Stories connect us to our past and orient us to the future that God has dreamed for us. We need to tell our stories so that others would know what God has done for us, in us, and through us. The North Texas Conference is committed to lifting up the stories of those whose voices we need to hear the most. These are stories that give a fuller picture of where we've been and help us chart a course for where we go from here. In our effort to build a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community in the North Texas Conference, we start here. We start by listening to one another's stories. Join us as we explore stories of challenge and hope in the North Texas Conference Black Church Experience. In 1968, the United Methodist Church was created through two unions, one internal and one external. The external union saw the merging of two Wesleyan bodies, the Methodist Church with more than 10 million members and the Evangelical United Brethren Church, or EUB, with nearly 750,000 members. Together, these two became the United Methodist Church. The internal union was the joining together of black and white Methodists, a condition the EUB required before they would unite with the Methodist Church. In our part of the country, this meant a merger between the Black West Texas Conference and the White North Texas Conference into a single racially integrated annual conference. The process of negotiating integration and the denominational merger took many years. It culminated in Dallas with a uniting conference held in April and May of 1968. What was once segregated became a single conference and a single denomination. What can we learn from this history? What power and potential can we uncover as we make our way forward together? This is our story. Share with us how you remember life first in the West Texas Conference. Well, um, it was a community. Um, mm -hmm. And the church was a community. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, in 1968, um, you know, in the 60s, we had black communities. Mm -hmm. And so the black communities also had black churches. Mm -hmm. And so when we went to church, we not only knew the people that lived in our community, we also knew them in the church. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, you, if you did something wrong, you, you know, your, your, your aunts and uncles were there in the church, but you also had friends friends that helped to raise you mm -hmm. there and they got you you know it was come on over here little girl sit down let me talk to you mm -hmm. lots different now than it was then I grew up with parents who insisted uh, on church attendance and church involvement so I was involved with the MYF and with Sunday school and um, I do recall as, as a young person how uh, fun field and meaningful the uh, vacation Bible schools were yes. uh, because you know obviously those are times you didn't have much to do and so um, so vacation Bible school became a a, a, a rich um, uh, time of experiencing other people and learning new things to do you know yes. so uh, yes. uh, so yeah so life in the in the church in the early years were um, were very um, meaningful and fun field and, um, uh, and enjoyable. It was a, a vibrant time for us, as I remember. Uh, it, at that time, we formed a close-knit communities that were interlocking that served us well. And it we allowed our culture to develop a style of worship mm -hmm. that was dynamic and it filled with uh, energetic preaching, dynamic preaching, and of course our own style of music. Yes. Uh, and I think that was a contribution to the Methodist Church that could not be replicated anywhere else. You know, you never know that you are in a segregated world when mm -hmm. you're in the midst of your world. Mm -hmm. Because if your world works well for you, mm -hmm. uh, when you are, 
are in that bubble, if you will, because it's, yeah. it's basically a bubble, mm -hmm. then you don't, you don't realize that there are other things that are going on outside outside that that world mm -hmm. uh, for us it was a grand time yes. uh, we thoroughly enjoyed going to conferences uh, getting to meet other uh, teenagers that were with us mm -hmm. in, throughout uh, the all of Texas actually yes. and then mm -hmm. some other places so uh, for us in the West Texas conference mm -hmm. uh, we had a good time I can remember um, times that we would have um, sock hops. You know, you probably don't know anything about that handy, but. <laughs> And I'm not certain I, I do. Well, <laughs> well, we used to have <laughs> sock hops in the church, and, and you know that that the, the United uh, the, the youth groups would have. We had a great big fellowship hall, mm -hmm. and we would invite. Uh, we only could invite so many people to our group. Usually it would came from another black church. St. Paul was very close to our church. Mm -hmm. And we would come together and we would have dances. And sock hops, you, you couldn't wear your shoes, you had to wear your socks. Oh. And so we danced all night long and it was secular music, mm -hmm. you know, and we had a good time. As we went to the church to do that because we couldn't go anywhere else. We couldn't go anywhere else. What was life like for me mm -hmm. in the midst of all of that? Yes. Challenging, very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, all, always uh, seeing through the dark to mm -hmm. the light, knowing that it would, it would come mm -hmm. in the midst of all of the difficulties, all of the challenges mm -hmm. that we, we, we faced. There was great uh, anticipation mm -hmm. uh, of what this transition would be. Mm -hmm. um, there was considerable talk about uh, how the, um, the merger of, of, uh, uh, of the uh, black and white constituencies of the, uh, of the, of the church um, would form a, a sort of formidable um, uh, religious denominational uh, uh, structure, uh, namely that the the uh, the African Americans would would bring to to the church its uh, its uh, uh, its strong emphasis on worship mm -hmm. and preaching, yes. and 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 somehow infuse the church with that. And the Anglo Church, with its uh, educational component, organizational structure component, yes. you know, all this was uh, <clears throat> was expected to make this a very uh, uh, formidable uh, denomination in the country. You know, so um, to some extent, you know, we're still <laughs> we're still looking for that. But uh, but that that was a part of the anticipation, though. Yeah. So were there feelings of fear, fear uh, feelings of excitement? Uh... Well, I think some both. Mm -hmm. um, uh, fear, and I don't want to call it, call it fear, I think there was concern about uh, what would happen to our history, you know? Mm -hmm. What would happen to our, our churches? Would we just fade in the background and, you know, uh, uh, and lose our sense of who we have been, yes. who we are, who we were, mm -hmm. and um, what strengths we had, you know, will they continue to, to grow and develop, or would they be mitigated by the presence of, uh, um, of a new church? Mm -hmm. you know, so, so there was a fear, but, but also there was, there was great anticipation on the other side, yes. you know, that this is an opportunity that, to some extent, our, our ancestors have fought for. Mm -hmm. Uh, and died for, lived yes. for. So, uh, so let's and we live into the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, right. And and, and let's uh, let's work to make this. Let's work to make this work. Yes. You know, because that's what we that's that's what we've been after all along. Um, I remember my mother uh, was very adamant that this would not work. Mm -hmm. You know, she she until she died, and you know, she died in 2020 um, this year, uh, 2020. And 2020, um, I remember her saying, see, look at our churches now. 
-hmm. You know, I told you that wasn't going to work. And I remember my mom saying my dad would come back home and talk about the meetings that they went to and, and the plans that, uh, that this uh, conference had. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mama says, why are we doing this? The only reason why we're doing it is because, you know, the United Brethren say it, you know, that they would not, uh, that we would have to get rid of the segregation in order for the Methodist Church uh, to be a part of uh, United Methodist. And my mother was, you know, she, she I, there were very clear conversations in my home that my mother did not want this to happen because she did not think it was going to work. Mm -hmm. Reverend uh, Mosby was appointed to an Anglo church, and so that had to be after 1968. Um, and he was one of the first uh, African American clergy to go to a white uh, Anglo church. And I remember him inviting um, my family to come to the church. And, and, and I think that that is what we did. The, the Anglo church uh, decided that they were going to send people to worship with us. And then we went to worship with them. But when we would go, we would go as families. I mean, it was a whole bunch of us going. You know, but when the Anglo church came to us, they always sent representatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and because of that, you know, and the, the black church, the families knew. Well, why is it that we go as families, but when they come to us, they only come as representatives? Um, and, and I think, I think that uh, that is another reason uh, that my mom really felt that, uh, okay, we're going to do this. I see we're going to do it, but this is not going to work. So, so I really hear you saying your mother was very skeptical of... Very skeptical. Very skeptical of authentic diversity. Very skeptical. Very skeptical of equity yes. as one church. Yes and very skeptical of true inclusion. Yes. Mm -hmm. We did not know what the outcome would, would be, and uh, we were concerned about our participation. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, beyond, in, in the merge, beyond the merger, our role that we would not lose anything, but that if anything, you know, that we would gain in terms of opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, roles, uh, positions, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that 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 would enable us and enable the church to mm -hmm. claim its its true identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as it moved up to toward merger, uh, I understand you were also part of those persons that were putting BMCR together to make to be an advocacy group for blacks once we took merger took place. Uh, yes, I, I I happen to be one of the few the group that was met. Uh, to, to form Black Merger, the, the merger for of, of Blacks in the church, BMCR. Mm -hmm. uh, we met and um, we talked about the challenge that faced us and we uh, designed our strategy for uh, breaking through some of the barriers that, barriers that we were facing. Mm -hmm. in, in the life of the congregation. Uh, and we made a motion to become a group, to an organized group. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But primarily organizing, you know, what it means to be Black and Christian mm -hmm. <laughs> in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And that, that was our story. We did not want to use, lose our identity Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we felt that we had contributions to be made and that we would be a blessing to the whole church, but we would also gain, you know, by laboring together, working together with our sisters and brothers mm -hmm. uh, to overcome uh, the racism uh, that we were experiencing. Our um, pastor at the time was uh, Reverend Dale Hansborough. Mm -hmm. and uh, Reverend Bruton had just left and come to Dallas. Yes. And so uh, they were, uh, they met at, at our church, of course, and we teenagers were sitting over in the corner listening to, to what they were talking about. And one of the things that they, the main thing that they were concerned about was that when the merger came about, we would lose our identity. Mm -hmm. That we, and we were going to lose uh, are who we are as a worship experience, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so we, we listened to them. Um, uh, 
I remember Bishop Dixon came and he was, they were talking about, okay, now how many bishops we're going to have? Are we going to lose our bishops? Are, are the bishops going to uh, be able to merge into the, the growing church the way it is? How are you, how are we going to assimilate? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was a word that they used that was really mm -hmm. interesting because that was a word that they used. Uh, mm -hmm. How are we going to assimilate and do we really want to assimilate? Mm -hmm. Not really. <laughs> well, there were a lot of angst on our side because we were all were already at a disadvantage. But then mm -hmm. we saw uh, a larger uh, possibility of, of not gaining grounds as we go into a much larger system. Mm -hmm. um, um, we were enjoying our own leadership and mm -hmm. therefore we could expect and plan and uh, uh, do the normal things that we had done. In this, uh, we were concerned about the voices at the table. Mm -hmm in making these decisions. Yes. And we also noticed that there was a small percentage of our leaders at the table. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we wondered about what impact are we really making? Mm -hmm. The other thing, and I can say this as a lay person, is that the ones at the table were clergy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, as many, uh, and I say this because the United Methodist women were always in the forefront of things. Yeah, I think so. I didn't even see United Methodist women at the table. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a, a big concern. A concern that we discussed within our household as a, a minister's family was how is it that this denomination was uh, so open arm? that they could embrace a whole nother denomination mm -hmm. and still have reservations about desegregating the black members of their, of, of their conferences. I've been told on more than one occasion that you were the last person ordained in the West Texas Conference. As a matter of fact, it was two of us. It was my roommate and I, I mean, our, our schoolmate, and I, John Green. Who now is is retired out of out of the uh, uh, Southern California Conference? But John and I were the last uh, people ordained in the uh, we were ordained deacon. Yes. Uh, while we were in seminary uh, in the old West Texas Conference. You and know, you were yeah. ordained by Bishop Eugene Slater. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. it would have been Slater. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I think it was in San Antonio. If I don't remember, if I don't, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. At, at the time, were you aware? or uh, anyone aware that that would be the last ordination for the West Texas Conference? Oh yeah, and, and, they, and they made um, made quite a, um, uh, it, it, became, it became a kind of a um, historical feeling uh, kind of a, a meeting because they knew that that would be the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, the expectations of the, of the, uh, of the new church and that sort of thing and uh, how we try to hold on to uh, uh, capture these moments of of history because they will they are fading you know and that sort of thing so you remember the last worship service you all had at annual conference in the west texas conference before merger oh lord <laughs> do i have to yeah i shall never forget it it was one of the most challenging moments in all of my ministry because we as African Americans in the United Methodist Church have struggled, had struggled to overcome many of the barriers which prevented us from reaching our God-given potential. And we had fought for merger because we thought that was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But when we got to that last day, when, when we called the roll and when it was clear that 
we would merge with other churches, we suddenly realized that would be the first time, next, the first time that we would be together like we were. Mm -hmm. That would be our last meeting in that conference, from that conference, that predominantly black uh, annual conference. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you, I never seen so many preachers crying mm -hmm. in my life. My dad was just there as a preacher. Mm -hmm. And I never seen my dad cry. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all, I mean, because we, we knew that would be our last together, the fellowship that we had. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was really a, a challenging moment and, and a painful moment. I mean, we were happy for the merger. We fought for that. We wanted to see that. But we knew we would never be again together again like we had been because that was a fellowship mm -hmm. that uh, was so very important to us. You may recall uh, the very first significant cross-racial appointment of an African-American to predominantly Anglo church. Sure. Uh, can you can share with us about that a little bit? Well, yeah, um, I it think in the 1990s, in the early 90s. Early, yeah, it was it was early 90s because uh, I was still fresh on the on the on the on the, on the cap. I think there was a sense of which that um, uh, it was time for us to try to make um, a step forward, mm -hmm. and um, at the time, uh, the church that that was viewed as the church that was probably more open mm -hmm. uh, and more liberal at that time mm -hmm. than any other place. Mm -hmm. uh, and that this was the more likely place yes. to make a change, mm -hmm. you know. That appointment uh, uh, became a little problematic uh, mm -hmm. early on I think namely because there were some misconceptions about whether being a liberal, a white liberal, um, accommodates um, change, cultural change mm -hmm. uh, from the other side, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's one thing to talk to talk. Yes. <laughs> it's another thing to walk to walk. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of learning took place in that because um, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a place and a time where uh, uh, where black pastors want to make sure that their, um, uh, their blackness was not going to be uh, in any way um, uh, swept aside uh, mm -hmm. just because I'm in a white, a predominantly white church. Um, and I think we, I think in some ways we're still wrestling with some residues of that, yes. of how, whether or not the perceived liberals uh, are, are as accommodating as one think they are mm -hmm. on paper. <laughs> Uh, the district superintendent called me. It was graduation day. As a matter of fact, I was at, at dinner with some friends. And she said, uh, I, I need to talk to you. And I was like, okay. Uh, I, and I told her where I was. And she said, oh, well, just call me later. And I did. And then she said, I want you to go to Webb Chapel, United you know, Methodist Church. Your first appointment. First appointment. First appointment. Seven years there I, mm -hmm. that I was there. Um, and I said, Okay, I don't know where Webb Chapel is, but but I'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting when I went there. Uh, the first thing I did was walk around the entire building, just inside and out. Just and one of the cornerstones on the building said Methodist Church South. Wow. Well, I bet you they didn't have that in mind when they were organized. 
Methodist Church South. Wow. And so I asked some of the, the, the congregants, I said, do you all know what that means? And one of, the, one of the men said to me, yeah, I do. I know what that means. I said, okay. I said, so what do you think about me being your pastor? Mm -hmm. And so he said, all I have to say, pastor, is football season, when football season comes, don't preach long. Don't be upset if we get up at 12 o'clock. We get up and leave because <laughs> the game's going to be over. We got to go to the game. And I was like, I won't be upset because my husband has to go too. <laughs> and so, you know, we kind of laughed at that. Uh, but uh, the one of the, the I want to say founding member, family founding members, you know, of, of Webb Chapel uh, said to me, uh, she, she's a trustee chair, she said, you know, we've had uh, women pastors before, but we've never had a black pastor. The, the, the lady who said that to me, I said to her, this does not rub off. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, okay, I said, I said, all of the black people that I know, that I know personally, are like me, and it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. So you're one of the few people in North Texas mm -hmm. who have uh, served in cross-racial, cross-cultural mm -hmm. appointments mm -hmm. more than once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, you, do you have anything you want to share about it? Well, I guess I do. I, I have a letter. The letter was sent to the bishop, mm -hmm. and it stated that we have experienced this woman uh, for two weeks, and if we do not, we do not like the African American worship. And if you were going to kill our church, you just have by appointing her mm -hmm. to our church. Mm -hmm. After two weeks. After two weeks. Mm -hmm. wow. And. Uh, uh, that was a little bit more than, you know, but I continued to do my work. Yes, you didn't quit. Yeah, didn't quit uh, because you realize that you're not serving the people, you're serving God first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and whatever you're doing for God, God will make a way to serve the, the church, the, the members, and the community. Mm -hmm. And that's how I had to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted the cross-racial appointment. I wanted to have the experience. Mm -hmm. But I also had my mother in the ear that said, I don't think we need to do this. I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> and uh, so that was just one of many examples that I had in the in, in, in cross-racial appointment. Mm -hmm. So it strikes me that the appointment you're describing was I mean, not only a, a cross-racial Opponent, but cross-cultural, um, the culture, um, the dominant culture in the church was different than the culture out of which you came and that you yeah. brought, and I mean that happens all of the time today as well. Mm -hmm. um, churches trying or being challenged to cross those cultural divides with the community that they're in, or maybe a pastor who comes. Um, are there lessons that that you learned about? Um, things to keep in mind when in those like cross-cultural kinds of moments or uh, you know ways you found to kind of navigate that yeah um, and w what I learned was that I had to be the true me I, I, I could not be anything else but the true me and the true me loved the people mm -hmm. the true me went into the community and found out what it was that the tr community needed and what the community wanted, and I brought it back to the church. Um, I, 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 I continue to try to be the true me with these, these areas, but at the same time, I needed to have something, uh, someone to, to, to kind of, you know, um, to, to kind of have my back, to kind of, um, and I, I didn't, I, I really felt that I needed to give up what I, who I was to be exactly what the church wanted me to be, and I couldn't do that. But there was also um, um, a, uh, 
uh, an interesting dynamic of, of, of not only um, um, change in terms of race, but there's also the subtlety of change in socio socioeconomic. Yes. When I was asked, when I was, when I was brought to North Texas from Central Texas, mm -hmm. and went to Hamilton Park, uh, but I remember my district superintendent uh, pulling me aside mm -hmm. and said, "Now let me tell you a little bit about this church." Mm -hmm. And so we went on to talk about, you know, you got a lot of teachers in here, you know, you got some doctors in here. He said, "Does your wife have a mink coat?" I said, do my wife have a, does my wife have a mean coat? No, he said, well, you know, it may be time to think about, it. Wow. you know, doing it. So it was, he was speaking to the, the, uh, the subtlety of that, of that middle class yes. uh, uh, orientation mm -hmm. that he felt was present at that church. Yes. And he wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that I was aware that I was stepping into a church mm -hmm. that had these kind of expectations, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he even, I think he may have even asked me to consider uh, lowering my uh, afro, which was big at that time. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I know if he didn't, some of the members did, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, so, 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 so some of those dynamics was going on at the same time of racial stuff. Yes. That was also the subset of socioeconomic uh, orientation and change about uh, uh, old ways, new ways of doing things. Yeah, know, so. it sounds like it may have also been a little of uh, cultural elimination. Well, of, of culturation. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think there was a sense of which, in which, that DS, like many others, probably thought that um, if this merger is going to work. Mm -hmm your people are going to have to be more like my people yes. mm -hmm. to make this work. Yes. Mm -hmm. And being more middle class yes. mm -hmm. uh, spoke to that. No. Uh, and he wanted to encourage that, you know, that, you know, you uh, do, will do well to, uh, uh, to accept uh, the way this church is mm -hmm. and to uh, continue to develop this kind of mindset Yes. And this kind of lifestyle in these people, mm -hmm. you know, if this merger is going to work, yes. you know. You know, I, I have to claim the progress that we made. You know, district, mm -hmm. you look at the district superintendents all over the United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. women, women ministry, in ministry, superintendents and all of those positions, boards and agencies, uh, involvement, our participation, the activity of the Black Methodist Church renewal, liberated whites and liberated Black folk working together in the United Methodist Church. I think we have to admit that we, we have gone a long, long way. It's been a difficult struggle. We had to struggle, man. but we, we have made a lot, large, uh, pro major progress. You know, the mm -hmm. election of bishops, black, white bishops. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a challenging ride, but, but we, 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 we made progress. We made progress. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've had our problems. We're going to continue to have. I think on some of the issues in you know uh, in the community, some of the issues you know we disagree and so forth and so on. But uh, we have made progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a, a a men's Bible study class mm -hmm. on Wednesdays. They were my Wednesday. There were five men, and they were all in their 80s and 90s. And the oldest one was 94, and he said to me, you know, before I met you, I had a totally different understanding of black people. Mm -hmm. I said, how many black people did you know before mm -hmm. you met me? He said, I didn't know any. I said, I know. You only know what you saw on TV, and I don't know those people either. Wow. And when uh, all five, well, uh, all five of them have passed away now, but when I got there, they each told me 
they, they told me the pastor that they wanted to preach their eulogy when they passed away. I said, that, that's fine with me. But before each one of them passed away, they asked me to, to preach their eulogy. Oh, that's yeah. So, it yeah. underscores just how important the relationship is. Absolutely. Breaking down barriers and um, you know, discarding assumptions and prejudice. Right. Mm -hmm. Relationship is the key. Absolutely. It, it, it's knowing people. You, people are people. When I was a disaster response coordinator, that was the best job, the best calling that I had. It was outside of the church, and um, and I worked I worked with the Anglo churches more than I did the, the African American churches, mm -hmm. and. And I did the same thing in my cross-racial appointments as I did in the, uh, in the disaster response. It's so, I, I, you know, I think about that all the time. What was it that was so different that I was able to work with the Anglo churches not being their clergy, their pastor, mm -hmm. than the disaster response? I, I think that the difference was is that we sat down and we listened to one another. Mm -hmm. And and I heard what they brought to they brought it to the table. They heard what I brought to the table, and we were able to jail, and we were able to do wonderful work in the North Texas Conference as far as disaster response is concerned. I think that's what we need to do. I think it's very important. You know, we, we talk about dismantling racism. We you know we we've, we've been talking about dismantling racism since I started this conference. Started in this conference, we're still talking about it. We're still talking about, uh, you know, studying uh, gay, lesbian, homosexuality. Why are we studying it? Why are we, you know, why, why, why are we saying that, um, you know, we're going we, we're gonna to get over this hump? We need to understand that we serve God first. And so when we sit down at the table, we need to, like, like Quincy Jones would say, check our egos at the door. And then come and listen to what God has to say at the table. You might not like what I say, but listen to what I said. I think what we have to wrestle with uh, in all of uh, this discussion about um, <clears throat> diversity and equity and inclusion um, is, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned the bottom line. And the bottom line is to what extent um, has, has and will these kind of changes make mm -hmm. uh, for the future of the church? Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, way of of, uh, of looking at it is that what has been our results? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what can we point to and say, we did this, we did that, we did that, mm -hmm. and look at where we are now. Mm -hmm. You know, across the church, I think we have to raise that same kind of question. Mm -hmm. You know, are we doing this just to look good on paper? Mm -hmm. Are we doing this just to say, okay, we got the first this, we got the first that, you know, we did this. Mm -hmm. Is a, but what is it doing to the bottom line? Yes. The bottom line is effectiveness in ministry. Yes. What, what does it say about our witness to the community? Yes. And our witness to the kingdom of God? Yes. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, 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 we, if we're going to be, to some extent, results-oriented, mm -hmm. we've got to measure all these things uh, in a way that it helps to meet the bottom line. Yeah, I think the needle has moved a little. A little. Uh -huh. uh, but I think we could do a much better job. I, I know that uh, my emphasis would be on African Americans, but as a member of the United Methodist Church, I really look at all of God's creations. Uh, we have not elected a Native American bishop 
Mm -hmm. uh, there uh, are limitations on the women who are clergy. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking about inclusion, um, mm -hmm. the diversity that we seek, I'm not sure that even the church knows what it, its goals are. But I, I do think that we remain open to the principle and the teachings of inclusion. Now, whether our actions have caught up with our goals, I don't think we are anywhere near Amazing. where God wants us to be, mm -hmm. or even where I want us to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that there are opportunities, uh, because all of it is, is not in the leadership. It is also how we're bringing our congregations along. One of the missteps that I think were had in this um, uh, merger is that there was no preparation of the people in the pew mm -hmm. for what was about to take place, yes. neither in the African American church or in the white church, yes. uh, or in the um, uh, uh, Hispanic churches nor in the Asian churches. Yes. Everybody, there's been not a real, uh, to me, global effort to saturate our congregations mm -hmm. with the urgency of being inclusive. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't see that. Because I think we have a long way to go as a church. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because we do not address the elephant in the room. Yes. We do not, as a church, uh, we, we skim around it, we go over it or under it, but we don't actually address the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, uh, Bishop McKee and I were talking one day and, and, and I said to him, uh, Bishop, until white men until white men stand up and say, this is wrong, yes. it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. I said, because white men are in charge of the way things are today. Mm -hmm. And so until you stand up and say, not just you, but the blanket, until you all stand up and say, this is wrong, uh, it's not going to change. I, I don't think we can afford to give up on that struggle. We can never be, we cannot afford the price of being satisfied with things as they are and where we are. The struggle continues. I think that's, that's my way. The struggles continues. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not arrived. You know, I, I, I'm hopeful and I must be hopeful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. We have not arrived. You know, we, we, we cannot afford the luxury of being satisfied with things as they are. Yes. You know, I, I talk about God's gift of a brand new future. I think God is always offering us the gift of a brand new future. We cannot afford the luxury of being satisfied with things as they are. Oh, mm -hmm. they can get better. And mm -hmm. uh, so we have to be, be embracing that, looking, facing that brand new future that God is offering us. Those are my famous words, God's gift of a brand new future.